into the path that we're meant to be, God. Bring us closer to you. Draw us nearer to your heart, God, so that we can learn to become more like you. God, my prayer is when I look in that mirror in the morning that I don't see me, that I see you through me, God. And I pray that's how everybody in this building and everybody that's watching this morning prays to be more like Jesus, God. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for everyone that has joined us this morning, everyone that's online or on campus today, God. Pray for this message and the word that's about to be fed to us, your people, God. We thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Hey, Freedom family and friends, this is Pastor Larry. It is Tuesday. July the 13th. Hope that you're doing well. Hope that you had a good weekend and a great start to the week. Hope that you're able to be in church and join us for church online or join us. Hope you're with us for on campus uh, service for our weekend celebration. We had a great, great Sunday, just, you know, worshiping the Lord, enjoying each other's fellowship and having an opportunity to grow in God's Word. And that's what we're going to do today together. We're going to grow in God's Word together. So grab your cup of coffee, your tea, your water, whatever you got, and let's get into Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick back up in 
uh, verse 14. We're probably going to run at it through verse 13 and then pick back up in verse 14 and go from there. But while you're doing that and getting settled, don't forget to like, share, and comment. That's right. Don't forget to do that. And I want to welcome you. And if you have a prayer request, I know some of that. I've even been getting some on my phone while we're online and praying for individuals in our church and those who are even going into surgery and having some procedures done uh, today. And I want to think of them and pray for them and they're on our heart. And so, you know what? You may have something that's on your heart. Uh, it may be job related. It could be, I don't know, or related to a family member. And it doesn't always have to be serious. It may just be something that's on your heart. Uh, you want God to work in and through. We'd love to hear about that and just pray for you uh, as we go along. So, Grab your Bible and let's get at it. You can always visit our website at freedombaptistchurch.com. And, you know, we are here to learn the Bible so we can live the Bible. We say that, and I haven't said it in quite a while, but uh, we've really adapted, embraced that uh, mindset and that simple thought here because truly that is what the Christian life is about, learning God's truth so then we can apply it and we can live out what he, God, is expecting and desiring of us and it is true, isn't it, that his way are best. His ways are best for us. He knows what we need. He knows what um, is absolutely going to be best. And that is why the Bible says that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a what? Do you know? A light into our path. That's right. And that is what we need. We need direction. We need guidance. And the Lord sure does provide it. So I'm glad that you're here. Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick up in verse 13 and, and then pick back up in verse 14 and start dissecting that today. I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for joining me, even if it's just for a few moments. Maybe you're at work and you don't have much time. I hope that maybe you can go back and catch the rest of this, or as some of you have been doing, you don't catch this till dinner time, um, and some of you catch it late at night or early in the morning because you have to watch and it late. And some of you are putting that late lunch with Pastor Larry. That's fine. I'm just proud of you for giving the effort to invest in yourself spiritually. And by the way, that matters. So thanks for being a part of this. Romans chapter 12, grab your cup of coffee. Your water, whatever you have, and if it's you're outside doing stuff and been outside, you drink a lot of water, don't want you to get dehydrated. And that's easy to do. All right. Romans chapter 12. Hey, here's what Paul said. He says in verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. We should obviously be givers. Christ is a giver. So we model him. We follow him and we're givers. It's not something that we're shy about or that we're offended when someone talks about giving after all as a Christian. This is our life. And by the way, it's not always voluntarily. Uh, uh, we give of our time, right? We give of our talents. We give of our serving and those matter. Because as you serve others, you are serving the Lord. And then he says, given to hospitality. And it's important that we open ourselves, open our homes, that we are welcoming to others. And then Paul goes into verse 14. He says, bless them, which per persecute you. So bless them and bless and curse not. Now, this is an interesting note as he goes from giving, being hospitable, and now, bless them that persecute you. Um, I find that it's a whole lot easier to be hospitable, and it's not hard to give when we have the right heart, heart but to, man, bless the people who persecute you, bless those who speak against you, bless those who um, aren't that nice and that kind. Yeah, this is what Christ would have us to do. And you know what Paul's reminding us? This is areas that we probably need to work on. These are things that we need to be reminded of. And the fact is, we know that, you know, after hospitality, that probably Paul is referring to that a lot of these individuals, okay, had gone through great times of persecution, and there had been many that are without. So what do we do? We remember those that are without. We remember those that may be less fortunate. We don't talk down to them. We don't talk about them. And we don't consider ourselves some of the social elite. 
or the spiritual elite. No, we care for those who suffer. We care for those, and we'll find that out in the next few verses, how this kind of tags along with us. But, you know, this is really dealing with our heart, isn't it? Um, as believers, and that's why Paul goes on to say, bless them which persecute you and curse not. And did you know in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, I'm going to read you this verse. Here's a great cross reference to this, and listen to what Peter said. He said in 1 Peter 2, 23, when he was reviled, speaking of Jesus, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Isn't it so easy to want to get even? Settle the score. Boy, I got to set the person straight. I got to let them know how wrong they have been. And there may be time for that. And there may be issues that or circumstances that you must have you know, a confrontation and communication. But if you can apply grace, then most certainly do that. And the Lord Jesus, um, none of us have experienced his type of persecution. And yet the Bible says he didn't even open his mouth about it. He said nothing to them. And this is interesting because if we're wanting to be more Christ-like, if we're wanting, if we're wanting to develop the maturity of being a committed, devoted, faithful follower of Jesus Christ, then we can't ignore scriptures like this and they're hard, I know, because it's easy to want to react and maybe even respond in a way that is kind of pleasing to our flesh. But Peter said when it came to Jesus, that's not how he responded. And then Paul says the same thing of himself in 1 Corinthians 4.12, Paul said being reviled. We bless, I mean, after all, Paul was a persecuted Christian. Yeah, it's interesting. He was the one who persecuted Christians, then became saved, and now is the one being persecuted. Interesting how that coin got flipped. But he says being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. It means we endure it. We take it. Because sometimes that's the way it is to live as a Christian. And, you know, this um, thought is kind of the virtue or the world. It, their idea of being selfless and non-self-absorbed and not prideful, to be honest with you, the world doesn't take that approach. Matter of fact, they kind of scorn at it. When we as Christians, maybe you, you take a humble approach and you take a loving approach or you take a grace approach and someone around you says, man, how come you don't take up for yourself? Man, how come you didn't tell them the what to for? How come you didn't set them straight? Man, if that would have been me, I'd have told them. I know. And I probably would have liked to. That's not working out grace in me. Paul says to bless them which persecute you and bless and curse not. I don't want to respond in a way that the world responds. So I got to work at it. I got to think about this. When things come against you, and by the way, it doesn't always have to be the world, it could be other Christians. It could be someone who says something mean to you that. You are taken back from because you didn't expect it from a brother or sister in Christ. Haven't you ever since? I have. I'm, I'm sure I've done that to people. And you know what? It's not right. And I don't want to be responding in the right, wrong way. So what do I do? I need to apply God's word. And this verse stuck right here in Romans chapter 12 is needful. I have to learn to be, I have to put this virtue in place. I've got to apply this. You know, the fact is God honors and blesses that, doesn't he? What does God honor and bless? He blesses obedience. I want to be obedient. And I would imagine that as a believer, if you know Christ as your Savior, you want to be obedient. You, you want God to bless you. God cannot bless 
disobedience and sin. He can't excuse it. He can't ignore it. He has to, as any good parent would with their children, when you know they're about to cause self-harm or harm to even others by their poor choices and decisions, what do you do? You step in as a parent and you tell them no or you warn them of something. And that's what Paul is doing here, lovingly. And then we get to verse 15. And look at verse 15, if you don't mind. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, Paul says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. This is a beautiful piece of scripture. And sometimes, you know, it's kind of, you know, said hastily in certain moments, and we all know what those are. But this really is a passage on Christian sympathy. I want to sympathize with others. I want to be a better sympathizer. It doesn't mean that I have to understand every situation that a person goes through. So, you know, well, you don't understand. You've never gone through it. That is true, but I want to have a heart to sympathize with you. And as Christians, when our brothers and sisters hurt, it ought to hurt us. When they are going through trials and difficulties, if we know about it, it ought to bother us. Um, I don't I don't like for my brothers and sisters in Christ to hurt. I, I love for them uh, to be living in victory, and I, I love for them to be pain-free, but that's just not life. Sometimes these things happen, but when they're in a blessing and God's blessing them, guess what? Man, I want to be waving the pom-poms, if you will. I want to be a big cheerleader of that. Thank God. For him being at work, but at the same time, when life is hard and tragedy has struck, I want to be sensitive in their moment, too, and not accusatory. I've been in places and I've been in situations, I, I, I bet you have, too, where at times individuals would say things that are kind of, um, well, they're not only accusatory, but it's demeaning and judgmental. They would say things like this when a person would go through difficulties, sickness, tragedy. They would give the tone or phraseology of saying and thinking, what did this person do? I wonder what they did to bring this on. Man, what an unfair and judgmental assessment we can be and do. Maybe they didn't bring this on at all. Remember the blind man? Remember the individuals in the Bible and the disciples? Individuals would ask, well, what did his parents do? What did he do? He must have did something to cause this in his life. Really? How is that possible? Why Why would you automatically assume that? I don't think that's applying this verse, right? We rejoice with them that rejoice and we weep with them that weep. Life, we live in a sin-cursed world. Life is brutal at times. People suffer all kinds of tragedies. Oh, they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that may be true, but it, but am I being desensitized? Am I losing sympathy? Are you losing sympathy because of the movies that we watch or the social media that comes in our life? And so we become desensitized to the real needs of people around us. We become inundated, right, with the same news, the same noise, the same thing over and over and over again to the point where now, man, it's just expected. It still should bother us when people hurt. And talk about psychology. I, Man, this is some great therapy right here in verse 15. I mean, how many of us as Christians, even as pastors, right, even as Christian leaders within the church need to learn to help and comfort a burdened heart. 
I have to work at that because sometimes you can get so busy in doing things of even normal, you and me. We get so busy in our day that when we fail to make that phone call, we fail to send that text of just encouraging. We heard something about someone that, you know, that was difficult or they're going through a tough time and we kind of go like this, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll get around to it. And then what happens? We don't. And, you know, think about this. We got to learn that no one comforts a burdened heart by just merely being jolly around them all the time. You know, just put a, turn that frown upside down and be happy and smile around them. Someone has to be strong. No, maybe they need someone to cry with. Them. Maybe they need a shoulder. Maybe they need to vent. Maybe, maybe they need just to work some things out. And it's hard, but sometimes they just need some ears and they don't need any mouth. In other words, they need someone to listen, right? And they're not really asking or wanting any input in the moment. They're just needing to work some things out. And I also thought that it's hard to bring a blessing to a glad heart with a wet blanket. It's hard to comfort the hurting with being jolly all the time. And it's hard to bring encouragement by being the wet blanket. So the first is true, the latter is true, and that is, man, can we be critical and judgmental and, and sensitive and kind of curt? And can we be just kind of, as the old phrase, a negative nanny, a negative Nancy? No offense to any Nancys out there, but you know how we, you know, use the words with names, you know, the patty praise and the negative Nancys. Do we kind of live our life in that realm? I said this this past, misery loves company. But you know what? I don't have to hang around that. I, I don't want to sit on that couch because I do want to be, I want to be joyous with those. I, I, I want to rejoice with those that rejoice, but I also want to weep with those that weep. And we often only want the hot moments, the fun moments, the happy moments, right? Because we just want that. We want that endorphin. We want that high of that. And it's hard to kind of get down to where people's lives are sometimes. And the truth is sometimes people just hurt. Sympathy is sharing. And I know sometimes we're private, and I respect that. Sometimes people are very private about sharing, and that's okay. But when we do know, and when you do know, it's good to share. Share to care, right? You've heard that. And just understanding another's feelings. I don't have to understand their experience, but understand their feeling and give them room on that because Paul says rejoice with them that do rejoice and the apostle Paul said weep with them that weep and I think this is a gracious outworking of what we find in another portion of scripture concerning us as the body of Christ so we bless them which persecute us that's hard but then we rejoice with them that rejoice. We like that part. But then weep with those that weep. Just being more compassionate and sympathetic. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, I want to read you this verse. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and this is concerning us collectively as the body, as the family of God. Check out what Paul says. He says, and whether one member suffer or all the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Man, if someone is being blessed, 
I want to thank the Lord for that. Someone gets to thank you or honored in the church or their job, they got a promotion, but you got passed over. I still want to be rejoicing with those. I still want to think of others and be thankful for how God is working in their life. And I think verse 16 in Romans chapter 12 is a natural follow of what we see. Because in verse 16, he says, be of the same mind one to another. He said, be of the same mind one toward another. We need to be this way to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We got to work at it. It's right. We're just a work in progress. We got to give each other room to work at this. You know, nobody, even Paul himself said, is not as though I've already attained. You know, it's not like I've arrived. I got all this together. No. And then he says in verse 16, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. So, you know, Paul says, you know what? Be of the same mind one toward another as a continuation of verses 13, 14, and 15. Just let love and trust and sympathy and interest be mutual across the board for us. Let's be known as believers who are very loving. Let's be known as Christians who are very trustworthy and are sympathetic. That's right. Even to those outside of your local church, you have such a big family as a brother and sister in Christ. you got family all over the world. You may not even meet or know until you get to heaven. you got a big family. We do. But that our interest should be mutual. We will have different opinions. We'll have different likes and dislikes. That's just natural. But we should be striving together, as Paul said, for the faith of the gospel. What unifies you and I is Christ in us. So while I may not understand everything about you or everything that you go through, I'm for you. I'm for Christ in you. And I, and I want you to be that way with me. You know, Philippians 2.4 says this, and it goes along with the first part, first part of verse 16. Philippians 2.4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How good have we been as Christians as thinking of others, but not just thinking, ministering to others. You you can't minister to everybody, even as a pastor. That is a difficult thing to do. It really is. And it's, it's a struggle for most pastors, I would imagine, that most pastors would desire to be everywhere, be in every home, meet with everyone, connect with everyone. It's just impossible. But it shouldn't change the desire that you want to connect with people and you want to be thinking of others and you want to minister to people. And I think this is so important. I think it's most important because we're all prone, if we would be honest, we're all prone to be self-centered, self-absorbed. It's, it's what we do. We're good at that. And sometimes it's easy to take little interest, if at all, in the things that concern others. And so the Apostle Paul here goes on to even press this home in light of what he said in his exhortation in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. He says, mind not high things, okay, and the end of verse 16, I mean, he says, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. And this is such wise counsel for us. In other words, we just aren't elevating ourselves and only thinking of ourselves. And then when we get to church on Sunday, oh, now, okay, I see so-and-so, now I'm going to think about them. 
right? You've probably seen the old cartoon, um, and it's a, just a quick caption, a uh, Christian cartoon that says it's two people, and it's Joe and Jim. And Joe says to Jim, hey, Jim, pray for me. And Jim says, okay, Joe, I'm going to pray for you. And then the next caption is he sees him on Sunday and Jim sees Joe and goes, oh, there's, there's Joe. Dear Lord, I just want to pray for Joe right now. And then he sees Joe. Joe gets close to him and he goes, hey, Joe, I've been praying for you, right? This is what we can do. This is not what's best. I'm sure it's good, and it, I'm even grateful for that prayer. The fact is, we can do better. We can be more sincere and sympathetic to others. And Proverbs 26, 12 says this, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Wow, I'm going to read it again. This is Proverbs 26, 12. I don't know if you read a proverb every day. By the way, you could read a chapter every day uh, of the month. And uh, I've been doing this for, uh, I don't know, so many years, like along with uh, other devotionals. But seest thou a man wise in his own conceit, there is more hope of a fool than of him. Man, that's pretty strong. I don't want to be that fool. I don't want to be that guy. And it's easy to be that person. And how much more the Apostle Paul has to say, I mean, he's kind of said this throughout Romans about this high-mindedness. How he warns against conceit because it's easy to slip into that moment. It's easy to fall prey to that. And here, here's the thing, he rebukes our pretense, and looking down of men of low estate. In other words, those who maybe aren't even where we are spiritually. Those who are less fortunate. Maybe those who don't learn as fast. That's not what a family does. And so it's very important. And as you read through these verses, you start seeing, man, our responsibility and our duty to one another. Man, the character of a believer. Yes, how we collect ourselves and how we minister as the body of Christ, but then Paul starts breaking down these things about us as individuals and us living as a Christian. We're going to pick back up on verse 17 on Thursday. I want to thank you for joining me today. You know what? I want you to know that you're loved and you pray for. And I really mean that. And so I looked through all the comments. I want to thank all of you for joining today. You are valued and you're precious to the Lord and you matter to us. And so, look, if you have a prayer request, share it. We'd love for you to also share um, this portion of Bible study. You can put that link right in your Facebook and those who link to you can get that. And so feel free to do that. We'd love for you to use this as a tool to encourage others. And you know what? Keep investing yourself by joining the Bible study. And it may not always fit your time and day. I get that. It's no problem. Um, but remember, you need investing in spiritually. And so feed yourself spiritually. Become a self-feeding Christian. This is just an avenue. There are many avenues. Um, and through our ministry, and I'm sure others, uh, as long as they teach the Bible and try to root you in God's word. But the fact is, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being a part of this study. Never take it lightly or for granted and continue to think of others. Be not high-minded, but be of low esteem. You know what? Think of yourself less. You know, don't think of yourself at, don't think, not think of yourself at all. Let's remember others and let's be and learn and grow to be more passionate, and sympathetic towards others. So God bless you. Thanks for being here today. Hope to see you.
Hope you'll get to see me because I don't get to see you through this camera lens. But I hope that you'll join me on Thursday. Until then, God bless you. See you then.